Okay, well, good? Okay. So, um, the ICANN contingency, um, which includes myself, um, Tanya, and Yasin, were charged with um, the topic of <clears throat> identifying data and information services that would be required by the stakeholders. So having spent now two and a half days listening to a lot of conversation, participating in a lot of conversation, um, it is truly of my opinion that having a very detailed discussion about services required, data information needs of stakeholders is extremely premature. Um, we are still, in my opinion, trying to conceive of what CMA2 is actually going to be. We don't know whether or not it's going to be a coastal web atlas, but yet we've, we've been asked to prepare two to three talks that are all focused primarily, by and large, on coastal web atlases. So um, I am going to proceed um, with the presentation with some modifications. But, and then Tanya and, and Yasin will sort of follow on. And, but we would like this to remain flexible. Um, when it's time to actually do some facilitation, it's perfectly fine to come off this subject of data requirements. I'm kind of kicking this off in large part because it's a follow-up to what we've been talking about um, all morning about stakeholders and stakeholder engagement. And the other point that I'd like to enforce or, or bring to the table, I know I'm not the only one who has recognized this, but the stakeholder list for this project is so big, it is daunting to think that this project with the size that it is could actually even begin to accommodate all the needs of all those people. So one thing to be thinking about when we are trying to really home in and identify what are those needs of the stakeholders is, are there any mechanisms that are, are available to us as a group to try and cluster and to prioritize what those needs are? Because we are not going to be able to meet all those needs. And we can spend an entire week sitting here making lists of people, of data needs, of um, challenges. Um, so I just want you to think about that as I kind of move forward with this. So forget my discussion at one. <laughs> it's really not that relevant. Um, but I will, there, there was some discussion about the, pot, the potential of using use cases as a way to connect with stakeholders. So I'm going to show you an, an example of an application that might be somewhat interpreted as a, as a use case indirectly. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about some of the information that we've, we've come to learn about stakeholder needs. Um, and then some of the things that we've already accomplished here, and then if I can manage to motivate and, and get some motivation and participation at a different level from this group, then maybe we can move on a little bit. So one of the things we have talked about, Ramon's talked about this um, in more than one venue, is some of the challenges that um, came out of CMA1. Um, stakeholder buy-in overall was not strong and that there was um, clearly conflicts with priorities and what people's capacity was to actually work on CMA1. And so while we've talked a lot about stakeholders, the one thing I would like to kind of throw out is consideration about um, the um, the, the authority, you know, where does the authority come for people to actually do work? So are we really, we're spending a lot of time talking about stakeholders, but perhaps some of, one of the communities that we need to engage are the, of the higher level officials who actually have the authority to identify individuals and prioritize their work assignments. So um, we, we heard this um, 
so many times in, C in CMA 1 that, you know, that I don't have the authority to do this or this is not part of my work and I'm doing this after my hours. And that's really not the way to be productive and to get people to engage um, productively and to develop products that are actually going to be used in the workplace. And then we've talked, you know, incessantly about data exchange and technology challenges. Um, so we've also um, have talked a little about really what what a coastal web atlas could look like and can be, and it has multiple parts, and it can take on all kind, it can morph into all kinds of shapes and forms. It really is about again how people are going to interact with this interface. So um, I thought I would just show you an example to kind of help make the point of how diverse the decisions can be, you know, how many decisions there really are to make regarding what it is you want this, um, this product to be. And so I have selected, um, at Tanya's recommendation actually was, so if you don't like it, you can blame her. But um, <laughs> the Mid-Atlantic Regional Council in the Ocean is a consortium of states, uh, officials, across the Mid-Atlantic region in the United States on the East Coast and, um, and they have organized and the motivation for their organization is primarily marine spatial planning um, which can be anything from commerce to energy exploration, resource exploitation um, mm -hmm. and, um, and coastal marine habitat preservation. So. Um, they have developed this portal, which is known as the Mid-Atlantic Ocean Data Portal, and it has several functions. I thought I'd just take a couple of minutes to run through them. So on the far left, you have, a func you have access to just information. So these are, this could be documentation. It could be links to um, resources. It has, and I need my glasses, it has um, access to, through the Explore, it has access to uh, a large data catalog, which is, um, has been really nicely organized. I'll show you some, um, some examples of that. And then the more visualization tools, which are kind of the more traditional things that we think about when we think about interactive mapping and coastal web atlases. So again, it has um, a really robust and nicely developed data catalog in it where you can search for data layers, you can access data that are available free, um, um, to the, in the public domain. You can get metadata and get links to sources. This is an interesting um, component to it. It actually has a place where it actually tries to get feedback from end users. So, you know, that this is an open, an open portal for anybody to come in and use. And so there is an opportunity, if you spend enough time exploring, to give them feedback. What is it? Or do you have something to contribute? Or do, do you need something that isn't, isn't readily available? So um, it's a really interesting kind of concept. I don't know how they manage the information that they receive through this, but it would actually be kind of interesting to know. Then it has links to some significant um, external data resources, including the um, the Ocean Biographic Information System, the Marine Cadastral Layers, and NOAA's Digital Coast. So these are um, other sources of large data catalogs. And then finally, what it has is what they call their Marine Planner. So this would be the equivalent of their traditional um, coastal web atlas. Um, and there's, um, I'll just go through a few examples of it. Um, so there's traditional layers that um, expand everything from political boundaries to um, marine life, renewable energy, security. Um, the interface is, is nicely done. It can be a full page. Um, you have, um, sometimes you have legends that just show up and sometimes they're so big that they actually are showing, they're actually linked to um, special files, PDF files to describe them. They also have built in in the functionality um, through those data layers. You can get access to the metadata. You can get access to downloadable zip files, whether they are ESRI files, shape files, or um, some other format. Um, you can get links to the actual content information. 
You can also export, you can create maps and then export them as URLs so that you can share them with individuals. So, so that's an example of um, a type of application that's been developed to support a large, um, diverse community of practice um, in the Mid-Atlantic region of the United States on the East Coast. Um, so kind of where I see us now is that um, we're in this kind of discovery process. Um, some, some of us have grumbled, some louder than others, but over the last couple of days that um, some of the things we should be talking about, maybe we should have already solved by the time we got to this point. But that's okay. We're here now. And so um, we need to kind of continue moving forward. So um, I have, as, as all of you know, we tried to put together a survey to get some input about stakeholder needs. And um, I'll show you the results of that survey in just a couple of minutes. The other thing is that we've spent largely the better part of the last two and a half days trying, trying to identify what the common threads are across these different or all these organizations who have come here. So who are your stakeholders? Who are your stakeholders at the regional, national, international level? So we've, we're, we're making progress. I mean, we've amassed just in the last day or so a big inventory of, um, of, of tasks that people are trying to do, what are their priorities. Um, I think that the, the anticipated outcome of that is, is to try and leverage where possible um, against other projects that are already underway or coming up, some that are larger budget than a project like the CMA2. So there is value in everything that's been going on here. It's just sort of how do we just keep, keep moving forward. Um, so again, it's really kind of about what it is we want CMA2 to do and to be. So getting to know the stakeholder audience, um, I mean, we know where they, most of their interests lie in these certain categories. Um, some of the observations that we've made in ICANN through other surveys that we've done is that if you engage your stakeholders early in the process, you can yield positive outcome. So if you engage them after the fact, you know, really, it's Doomsville. I mean, the potential for Doomsville really can be there. Um, so we are, in fact, on the right track there. Um, but they need, they are, they typically in the past have, have expressed that their motivation for being part of the process is their need for access to data and information. Um, and that, um, but what we've also learned, um, in a number of projects is that they are, they tend to be inhibited by political bureaucracy, what allows them to participate. There is resource limitations, they're spread too thin, they work on six different projects, and the, the Atlas project is just not a priority. So, so again, there are many ways to learn more about your audience. I have selected and opted in this particular case, because it was actually relatively fast, I could sit in my office and create this. Um, and I did model this after an existing survey that was already in place. I can't remember, Tanya, where that survey was being implemented. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, so I opted for a survey monkey. And the goals of that were just to kind of collect some baseline information um, and to um, get it out there to um, start kind of accumulating some information about what the stakeholders actually wanted. Um, so I will run through the answers um, to what we have so far, but the, the important thing that I want to say up front is that um, based on the number of stakeholders that have already been discussed and identified, this survey is about as pitiful as it could possibly be right now. So I have had all of 17 results. And the intent for this is that, that you take this survey and you distribute it. So you are in charge of getting the feedback. And um, I don't know who the stakeholders are. I'm not connected to them. You know, I am only vaguely and loosely connected to you. So, um, so this is not a good represent re representation of, of what we want the atlas, if we want an atlas to be built on. 
So we need to really get this thing out there. So, and I will say this, is that I did develop this on my own. I had it reviewed by several people that are in this room now. But it's not that this can't be um, improved upon. So I am open to some um, suggestions of maybe there's some part of this that we could add in. Not that it's going it, to, it's not going to increase the participation but um, it might increase our ability to collect some information perhaps in an area that I hadn't really discovered or thought was important until this meeting. So um, by and large you can see that, the, um, that um, nearly everybody thought that um, having a coastal web atlas was important and that only a small number of people actually still had, had such a tool. So this, I know this is difficult, but this is the, um, the um, distribution of the different types of products or data information elements that one could ask for. I know that there are others, um, but what was kind of interesting was that what rose to the top was rivers and streams and geology, political boundaries, transportation. Um, so I was sort of disappointed that I didn't see mangroves and coral reefs and <laughs> marine spatial, you know, um, um, marine managed areas or things like that. But so those are kind of interesting. Again, Tanya and I were talking about that this is sort of framework stuff, very baseline data sets. Um, so do you have an atlas that you'd, or data that you'd be willing to contribute? If so, um, list and provide the contact information. So this was asking for some feedback. What was interesting was that 50% of the people answered yes, or basically had an answer, which means that 50% of the people did not have any data to contribute. Um, and so getting into, okay, if you had data contri to contribute, what were the barriers that would prevent you from contributing data? And um, so, oh, I'm sorry, are there barriers? Um, I apologize. So um, there were um, more than 43% of the people said that, that, yes, that there were barriers um, to contributing. And very and very small percentage said that there was um, no data at all to contribute. So does the organization have a web server cap capable of serving maps and spatial data? This is sort of a little bit all over the board. Um, so you had 25% um, of the people really weren't, didn't know, which says something about, you know, the technical um, savviness of some of the stakeholders. They don't necessarily, are not that connected to the actual um, behind the scenes um, back-end operation of, um, of their services. So regarding what the uh, mapping um, serving capabilities were, this is just evenly distributed. Nobody use, claimed to use GeoServer, um, but MapServer, ArcServer, Arc Arc ArcGIS Online, so were um, evenly distributed. Again, we're only talking about 16 people. Um, I thought this one was kind of interesting. In a climate where I keep hearing things about um, selling data, restricting data access, and things like that, that when asked who should actually have access to the atlas, oh, the overwhelming people said everybody. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Maybe they didn't really get the question. <laughs> um, and then trying to get into some of the features and functionality um, about what people um, really wanted to see. Um, license access rose out pretty heavily. So that was a feature in the Coastal Web Atlas that people would like to see, which again was kind of interesting because, you know, before they say that they'd like to have everybody to have access, but they want that access somehow restricted or licensed, which um, was kind of interesting. Um, and everybody wanted to see it, or a large number of people wanted, rated it pretty important to have it available in Spanish, but I only had one person take my Spanish survey. So the, uh, <laughs> the survey, by the way, has been translated into Spanish, thanks to one of my staff people from Uruguay. So again, some take-home points for me, um, that surveys are reasonable 
proven mechanisms to analyze populations. Um, and that the success of CMA2, as some people we've been talking about, could hinge or does hinge on stakeholder buy-in. So how do we get that? Well, knowing who they are, understanding what their needs are, and engaging them early. And we've talked about that. Um, but the current participation, um, trying to actively get find a way to communicate with the stakeholders is really Graham and that really is your homework to do that. Um, so I would encourage then for you know when you go back to your countries, your offices, that you make some attempt, maybe use this list that we've come up with over the last couple of days would be a good pl platform to try and identify um, one or two people maybe within the agency or the program that was identified and, and, and send, this, send this survey out. And then, you know, the next time we meet, um, maybe we can have another discussion about it or I will certainly um, do something with Peter to make sure that the results actually get posted and, and distributed. So I think that was it. And I do want to acknowledge the, um, the portal project team from Marco for have, having... They didn't know I used this, but they allowed me to use their stuff. So, um, okay. So, do you want to, um, have Tanya, or do you want to have? I want to have the Colum Complaints presentation.